Welcome to the Mound at Cincinnati. A beacon of peace, beauty, and faith for southwestern Wisconsin and beyond. A place of rich history, sacred to diverse native peoples, and revered by trailblazers and visionaries. A land deeply blessed, from where thousands of women have gone forth to preach and teach the gospel as Dominican Sisters of Cincinnati. Cincinnati is both home and final resting place for many, the place where this story began 175 years ago. The story of the Dominican Sisters of Cincinnati begins with a young Dominican friar from Milan, Italy, Father Samuel Mazzucchelli, who answered a call to join the Dominican Order of Preachers at age 17, and in answering that call, boldly responded to the needs of the church on the American frontier. The young friar came to the United States and was ordained a priest. He then lived out his vocation by spreading the gospel, building churches, and founding faith communities throughout the Upper Midwest. Unique among these foundations was the Cincinnati Dominican Congregation. He was called to come down this way to this influx of Irish and German Catholics. The two biggest towns, if you will, were Dubuque and Galena, and the mound just happens to be right in the middle. When Jones, the gentleman who squatted here, I mean, he took the land, he never bought it. He just planted himself here to make a fortune in the lead boom. Father Samuel was in Galena, and he was trying to get to Dubuque, and he thought, if, was there a faster way than the river? The story is that Jones said, yes, I'll give you a ride all the way to Dubuque if you will come to my place and say mass for my wife. That's how Father Samuel saw the mound. He had this view, he had this vision, there are apocryphal stories of him stepping out of the carriage and just saying, this is the place. And three years later, he bought it from Jones. Father Samuel obviously had a dream when he found this place and thought it would be a great place for a new province of Dominican friars and really started with a men's college. The friars talk to each other about this possibility, this idea of organizing groups of women who might do these ministries. He knew the sisters in Kentucky. He was aware of what the sisters could do. So he wanted to do that here at Cincinnati. Two women came to him to say they were interested. Other women came. It was three and five and four and six. But by 1849, the sister who had been the leader said, we're not gonna make it. We're too poor, we don't have enough people, it's not going to survive, and I'm leaving. This is February in Wisconsin, so it must have been really uncomfortable anyway and cold, and here the two people that were supposed to be leaders were bailing on this project. It must have been very unnerving and frightening for them, I would think. The genius of Father Samuel, he founded the sisters, guided them, wrote the first rule for them, but he never told them what to do. And what he said was, it's whatever you decide. Clara Conway, who was the oldest in religion, we would say, for some reason said, I think we should abide by the decision of the youngest. It was Rachel who said, in the name of God, let us remain together in our present community. That was monumental, not only for the women of this region, but throughout, as it will be, the United States and beyond. From that courageous decision, the Cincinnati Dominican Congregation eventually expanded in members and in its Ministry of Education. We have four essential pieces of Dominican life prayer, ministry, 
community, and study. If any Dominican house, you will notice that we all kind of have our own library. <laughs> we are a collector of books. And the study is never just for us to be hoarded. Study is so that we can utilize the study and share it with others. In Father Samuel's time, women's education was minimal. Father Samuel's vision is that these women should be educated to the highest level, and no subject was unfit for a young woman. Education was everything. They taught during the day, and he taught them at night. He brought in people to teach them. It was all about that mission. The students had a phenomenal curriculum for the time, music and art. They learned stitchery, and they can play the harp and the piano. Theology, biblical studies, history, kind of what you would expect of a good, strong liberal arts education. What's distinctive was an uh, emphasis on the sciences. He ordered some instruments for experimentation from New York, plus he made his own. There's this wonderful statue at Dominican University where he has the sister and a student in the telescope looking out. Those who seek justice will see the stars. There were newspaper articles about the hazards of teaching women the sciences like chemistry and biology and physics because women would have nervous breakdowns if they studied those or possibly could never become pregnant. Honest to God, it was in the newspaper. I read the newspaper articles. Not everyone believed that, obviously, but that's a very avant-garde to have such a strong scientific education for the young women. On one hand, an advocate for the sisters, but not somebody who interfered in their decision-making and that really respected their autonomy. He had them get incorporated as a civil corporation very early in their existence. He wasn't a member of that corporation. They wanted to put men's names, and he insisted that these would be the names of the people on the corporation. He knew every mover and shaker just because of his own reputation. He knew Doty and Dousman and Jones. He also knew William and James Ryan, who were real estate business people from Galena. The friars here sold the mound to William Ryan. This was investment property. They knew Father Samuel, they knew the sisters, until after Father Samuel's death. Father Samuel always said the mound was home, and he always envisioned everyone coming back to Cincinnati Mound. So with that in mind, Mother Regina Mulqueeny, who was all of 26, and Sister Emily, 22, came to visit Ryan to ask him if they could buy the mound back. And they had scraped together enough for a down payment. They went in to see him. Mrs. Ryan went to get tea or something. When she came out, they were already putting on their mantles and in tears. And she said, what happened? Mother Regina said, he said no. Mrs. Ryan said, that's no way to treat Father Samuel's sisters. And she persuaded her husband to change his mind. Thus continuing remarkable growth for the congregation under the eventual watch of one of the sisters present at that pivotal meeting, Mother Emily Power. Mother Emily's entire education was the school in Benton. Father Samuel met her when she was a little girl. So she had him as a teacher, a pastor, a mentor. His vision of what school was, was Mother Emily's. She was very gifted academically. They gave her a lot of responsibility even while she was a student. When Regina died, Emily was the next person elected. Now, she was one of the youngest in the community. Her own blood sisters were older and more experienced than she was, but the congregation elected Emily as prioress, which tells you something. She must have been very intelligent to navigate an expanding congregation. She was greatly committed to find opportunities for learning that weren't necessarily the formalized classroom. She really made it possible and encouraged sisters to participate in the Columbian Exhibition, the World's Fair in Chicago. We know other congregations were forbidden to go to the World's Fair because it was so secular and they shouldn't be seeing what they were going to be seeing. Whereas the Cincinnati sisters, go, go, think of what you'll learn. 
I mean, that was her attitude. She sent sisters all over the country to study. Places in Chicago, places in Milwaukee, places in New York, places in Denver, a lot of faraway places. Those moves were the big breaks from an exclusively Wisconsin-based ministry. Our sisters tried to go to as many places and respond to as many places as possible. She understood that was an educational opportunity and that they'd see new things. However, with new opportunities come new challenges and dangers. But Mother Emily and her sisters were equipped to handle them. Oh, Mother Emily, we have a little pearl-handled Derringer. We know it's hers, her name is on it. A friend, possibly an alum, felt she should have this for her protection. Basically, you know, for travel in the wild, wild west. I never heard a story about it being used. People loved her. She was Irish, she was witty, she had a sense of humor, and she was re-elected until she died while in office. Now, on her council was Sister Samuel Coughlin from Faribault. She was asked to finish Mother Emily's term. Sister Samuel became Mother Samuel and was re-elected for another 39 years, so she served 40. So we're facing 175 years. For 82 of those, those two women were in leadership. People kept re-electing these people. And they served much beyond their terms. They were kind of like dynasties. She faced all of these demands that were increasing, sisters in schools, all of the needs to keep educating sisters. She built a university during the Depression. How people did these things is kind of hard to get your mind around, really. Mother Samuel, who also had the same education as Mother Emily, had a sense of a need to look at the big picture. She started all of our sisters studying in Europe, opened our villa for skilled nursing care for our sisters. She was given an honorary doctorate by Loyola for her contribution to Catholic education, and it continued. It kept growing and growing, as did the congregation. Under the guiding hand of Mother Emily, Mother Samuel, and all of the inspiring, visionary leaders that followed them, this once quite small congregation continued to expand. I'm originally from Texas. I connected with our sisters in San Antonio. I met our sisters when I was growing up in Denver, Colorado. I was in an elementary school, St. Dominic's, a parish school where our sisters taught for many years. They were my teachers from third grade to eighth grade. I was born and raised in Chicago, and when I started first grade, our family moved into a parish, and it was the Dominican Sisters of Cincinnati, and their beautiful white habits, and the big old veil, and the whole deal. And the sisters had a certain type of joy, being together and working hard. I mean, can you imagine one adult with 50 kids <laughs> in a classroom? I thought, man, that's cool. I would like to do that. It was the sisters' love in the Dominican life and Father Samuel who really drew me, they were all different. And yet, when they came together and prayed together, they were one collective, faithful group of women. I can remember, even as early as fourth grade, thinking about becoming a sister. The combination of scholarship and faith or contemplation and action that I witnessed in the sisters, I just knew that I wanted to be part of that. Women were laughing and they were smart and they were funny and they were committed. And I thought, this is not a bad way to go through life. I entered after Vatican II. So I never lived under what you would call the pre-Vatican world of religious life. Sisters were wearing their own clothing or they were wearing versions of a modern habit. Many of them had changed their names. The impetus started with Vatican II, and then I think it just kind of kept unfolding. I think there was a wholehearted embrace of what was coming from the Vatican Council, looking at the signs of the times and the needs of the world. What is this calling us to? How do we have the church be relevant to people in a new age and a new time? 
knowing what Father Samuel was like, knowing what the First Sisters were like, looking at their efforts to respond to needs that were evident in their time was an encouragement to try to look to see what needed to be done. Some people who had been teaching for a number of years thought that they could serve well as a medical doctor. Back to medical school at an age where you were maybe 10 years older than everybody else in the classroom. If you thought you could serve a poor population by being a lawyer, you went back to school. Part of our call as Cincinnati Dominicans is to go through life with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other from a perspective that sees Christ in everyone that we meet. We're able to be with the people. Our natural instinct to respond to needs and to go where the need is and do what needs to be done. In the Sisters' Constitution, they have this phrase at the heart of ministry, is relationship. I think what the Sisters have taught us with their lives is there's no real distinction between the life of the congregation and the life of the world. The congregation is in the world and always has been. And we are all contributing to its flourishing or its decline. That's why we watch the news. You'll see Dominicans will read the papers, we pay attention to the news, because how can you preach something if you don't know what is going on? And how does it apply to scripture? With catastrophes, with the divisions, we have to be avid learners. And that goes, part of our ministry has moved in more into social justice. When I finished classroom teaching, I was doing parish social services in Washington, D.C. People were getting evicted from their homes. So it was like, you know, that must really feel awful getting thrown out of your house. And those were the days when the cups and the saucers and the beds and the mattresses were on the sidewalk when I'm walking to work. And I thought, aha, uh -huh. what I need to know is the law. So I got myself into law school. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, I was a fighter. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take them on. <laughs> We are in a position to do that. You know, we don't have a spouse and kids that other people might have to be more concerned than we are. I feel that's part of our call to risk. I've been very involved in a group of our sisters that has gone to the border every year with the newly arrived asylum seekers, learning about immigration firsthand from the people who are experiencing it. Welcoming at the center helping people translate for whatever it is they might need, provide food, clothing, serving people, and it's an ongoing need. To come into another country in a situation where they had to escape and to be safe, to be welcomed, especially after a journey that no one would ever want to take. Giving people that sense of belonging, which it's sort of like that love one another and take care of each other stuff you know, that Jesus talks about. So I was able to go down there and do legal work. Some people get really vexed that I'm not in a habit and that I'm not the way they think I should be. Like, you should be in the chapel on your knees praying instead of out banging on the doors, marching for immigrant rights. Bold and brave, the Dominican tradition of risk-taking, peacemaking, and service can be seen around all the world the United States, Europe, Bolivia, and Trinidad and Tobago. We have sisters in Trinidad and Tobago. That's the last island of the Caribbean. We opened up a house of discernment there. Many of our sisters have gone there and got to experience their culture. We've gotten to learn about the steel pan and the music. Another opportunity to see how we not only impact another part of the world, but how it impacts us. They have touched many people's lives, and they worked with other congregations. It was very much collaborative. It opens up new lenses. It's broadened us. It's the same thing as when our sisters went to Bolivia. In Bolivia, I ministered among an indigenous population called the Guarani and lived in a very small village of about 100 homes. I was part of a group that joined with Bolivians and Guarani to build homes for each of the families. I came to learn an understanding of sisterhood, of mission, 
that expanded into a huge worldview. And the sisters, the Bolivian team, were deeply loved by the Guarani people. Whatever they had, they offered us. And that's what I learned in Bolivia, is just that whatever you have, inside or out, is for the service of God's people. Risking comfort and privilege, the Dominican Sisters of Cincinnati have taken a stand to confront racism, human trafficking, climate change, nuclear weapon production, fracking, irresponsible gun ownership, and the death penalty. Living their lives on the front lines of change, their lessons have been delivered in over 250 schools, health clinics, social work offices, parishes, camps, and colleges, where the Cincinnati Dominicans have served over the past 175 years. I tell our students, this education is not only for you, it's for your community as well. We are going to know if you're not here, and we are going to make sure that you can be here so that you can succeed. This is the inheritance we have from the sisters. You can feel that, that they are still here in spirit, and that really says something about them. It's kind of like a call to action. Now it's up to us to make sure that this movement and this mission is still here. How can we help the community? How can we as a Dominican community help our brothers and sisters in the world? The leadership styles and the visionary that the Cincinnati Dominicans are, the way that they empower the students, not just about academic skills, but about community skills and the world views. I've taken many members of our faculty and staff to the mound, to the mother house, so that they can meet more of the sisters. And almost without exception, people come back from that experience having had their sense of the importance of relationship deepened, having had their sense of care nurtured. They come out of it with a sense that they are part of something greater than themselves. That's a tremendous, tremendous legacy. Over 3,400 women have made profession as Dominican Sisters of Cincinnati and have set out to more than 500 ministry locations all around the world. This includes the Spokane Dominicans, who joined the congregation in 1995, and the Dominican Associates of Cincinnati, men and women who share in prayer, study, and spiritual growth with the sisters. A worldwide family, seated at God's great table. The oneness of it. To meet people from around the world when I say I'm a Cincinnati Dominican sister, and they say, well, I had sister so-and-so in first grade, or somebody taught me at Rosary College. One of our associates recently went to Alaska. And when she met some of the people, she told them she was a Dominican associate of Cincinnati. And they're like, whoa, we know the Cincinnati sisters because we've had different sisters be there and do pastoral peace. And many times they would fly a little plane and go to little villages. And they welcomed her because she's family. The sisters who went before us, it wasn't about them. It was something bigger that they could invest their lives, the stamina, the courage, and compassion. You can have all the degrees in the world and all this, that, and the other thing, but if you don't have compassion, if you don't have a heart, then what's it really all about? My first morning at the border, I remember walking by a room and seeing something out of the corner of my eye. And it was a dad and his son that were kneeling by their cot. And it dawned on me, I'm not here to give anything. I'm totally here to just join with. Being part of a mission that's center is the love of neighbor. That is what life is all about, is who are you going to be sitting at the table with? Who in history, Martin de Porres, Antonio Montesino, Father Samuel, who all these ate with, and who's not at the table? Who's missing? Who do we have to go and find to make this picture complete? What better way to spend our lives? 
We have a great past and present to rely upon, and our future is only going to make us better. There's no doubt about it. Reflecting back on my life and reflecting the choices that I've made, now that I know this life, there's nothing else I could choose. And it was a choice because I entered at an older age. I've had relationships and a boyfriend. I know the choice that I've made. I've lived this life for 15 years, and I would have never envisioned it for myself. But it's been the greatest gift. My first and always love will be our sisters. The deep faith, the endless humor, the resilience, the incredible heart for God's people that my sisters have is really what gets me out of bed in the morning. We certainly are not women who agree with each other all the time, but there's a much deeper connection and a deeper affection for who we are as unique individuals, that somehow we're all in this together. To be able to go through the changes with other people, to have people to work out your life with. My life has been so enriched by the variety of people that I've met over the years. It's wonderful how it all weaves together in the fabric of life. It's been quite amazing. I'm a lifer. <laughs> I was going to be a high school English teacher in Minnesota. That was my vision for my life. Get married and have five kids, three boys and two girls, like I had something to do with that. But that was my plan. I have been to Europe. I never thought I'd travel. I have taught college. I have taught little kids. I was asked to go to school. I got to go to Notre Dame. I mean. Every time you turn around, another door opens, even if it's not the one you were going to pick. You start like this, and your world just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's who I was meant to be. For the past 175 years, the Cincinnati Dominicans have been called to preach and teach the gospel of unconditional love. And as the future unfolds, the need for mission has never been greater. In the words of our sister, Kay Ash, we need good companions in order to persevere in it. In good company, in a community of conviction, the quest never loses its relevance, its urgency, or its savor.